Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. This is uh, the panel on financing and scale, the in scaling the industrial hard tech innovation space. I know we're going to have a really, really good uh, discussion. I'm Deborah Yedlin, President and CEO of the Chamber of Commerce, and with me is Aaron Madro from Evoke Innovations, uh, Roland Mwanga from TC Energy, and Greg Heath from RBC Capital Markets. We're going to launch. Yep. We're going to launch into the Q&A right off the bat, and um, 10 minutes before the end of the panel, people want to ask questions from the floor, we'll open it up to questions from the floor. Does that sound okay? All right. Um, Greg, I'm going to start with you, and I'm just going to just sort of set the stage here. We know innovation is obviously key to our collective energy future, but we need to develop, commercialize, and scale new technologies, and that means having access to capital. What sources of capital exist today, and what is strategic versus institutional capital? How does, how, where does institutional versus strategic capital fit into this context? First, I'll make obviously on. Second, I'll uh, just um, compliment you on your shoes. It was, it was hard when they said, no suits, no ties, dress casually. For a banker, that's not my area of comfort. My, my boss is here, and I thought, ooh, wearing jeans to the conference, I wasn't sure how Derek was going to respond, so I'm probably rounding down on my bonus for this year by wearing jeans. <laughs> but uh, great question, Deborah. And there's really, in energy transition, there's three type, three classes of capital, and each, cap, each class has a different risk appetite. So we tend to see venture capital is really the first capital to come into an investment. And generally, venture capital has a relatively meaningful tech, tech uh, risk appetite. Um, maybe not so much, maybe variable risk appetite on management teams, uh, market risk, and Aaron, you'll be better, to, better positioned to, to talk to this, but we tend to see venture capital come into the capital structure first. And for most clean tech and energy transition companies, the next form of capital that we see move into the business as innovation becomes or technology becomes uh, commercialized is strategic capital. Now, strategic capital is perhaps a little bit less return sensitive than you might see institutional capital. They're there for a reason. They're there for technology adoption, uh, investment into the technology to capture it for a strategic advantage. And really, once a business is established and has a sight line to profit, then we see institutional capital in. And that's really the private institutional capital is generally the last step before we see a company that's ready to go to the public markets. Aaron, do you want to weigh in on it being at Evoke? Sure. Yeah. yeah, happy to. So Evoke Innovations is an early stage venture capital organization headquartered in Vancouver. We invest in clean tech. And for us, we're investing at a very early stage in the life cycle of a company. So these are companies that are just coming out of the lab. They've maybe got a prototype. And the stage that we invest in, I, I laugh, we say, if you can't pick it up anymore, that's probably when you should call us and, and we can start to give you some funding to scale your company. Um, but truthfully, we rely heavily on, on companies leaning on government grants and what we call non-dilutive funding. Um, so government actually plays a pretty significant role in early stages of the, of the life cycle of a company like this, especially a deep tech science heavy um, organization that really needs a lot of capital early on and still has a lot of risk from a technical standpoint. And we come in and we often match some of those funds um, and we're positioned really to take on that technical risk as, as Greg um, implied and, and we're looking for opportunities that have the opportunity to literally be a 10X company. And we often say, unless you're poised to do something like that and grow massively, it's probably not worth venture capital. Um, it's quite expensive. And, and the way that venture capital works is that we, we're based on a portfolio basis. So we expect that a lot of those companies will go to zero um, or have a, a very small return. And we only need one, maybe two, to have a substantial return to sort of make our investors happy at the end of the day and, and deliver the returns that they need. So we're quite, uh, we're quite open to risk and taking that tech on. Um, what we actually invest in first and foremost is, is teams and people. So the tech has to be there, obviously, and it has to have potential. The market has to be there or at least have legs to grow there. Um, but fundamentally, we are investing in people and that's what we really are, are basing our, our decisions on at the end of the day. So just... Strategic capital versus venture capital. Do you want to expand on that? 
Yeah, you know, strategic capital would be an, an organization that has a different business model but can absorb or use the tech for a strategic advantage. So if you thought about an oil sands producer that could bring in a technology to extract uh, precious metals or base metals from tailings, right? So that's not their core business. You know, the oil sands producer's core business is not extraction of those metals, but they look and they see a value add, they see some environmental uh, opportunity, they see a strategic opportunity, so they'll come in and provide some capital to advance that business. Often they'll provide something more tangible than just capital, like a site to host a commercial demonstration, or perhaps a partnership in a business model to advance the business. So strategic capital has, if you will, they have um, objectives that are other than just return driven. Roland, that strikes me that that should be the sandbox where TC is playing. Let, tell us about some of the strategic investments you are able to, 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 to talk about. Yeah, no, absolutely. Good morning, everyone, and really glad to be here and meet you all. Um, so maybe I'll start with where we're coming from as a company. Uh, we set our emission targets um, last year, and, and the first step of that is reducing our carbon intensity 30% by 2030. Um, we're 2022. That's a very aggressive target, um, ambitious target, but we're committed to it. And to get there, we believe in technologies that are there today, and it's really a matter how you're going to scale them up. The next point of our, our, our um, targets is positioning ourselves for net zero by 2050. And some might say 2050 is far out, but when you start to talk to folks like um, Aaron and Greg here, you realize that the technology is kind of in that incubation phase right now. It's being evaluated at bench scale, potentially folks looking for uh, piloting scale um, areas. Um, and that's absolutely where TC comes in. Part of what we've done when we kicked off the energy transition group, which I am um, a part of, is we've said, look, we need to kind of look a little um, earlier in the maturity scale of technologies. And as a result, one example of that, earlier this year, we made a, a, a small investment in um, a carbon capture company. They're Carbon Clean. They're a UK-based firm. Some of you may know about them. The intriguing thing about their technology and why we uh, were committed to making that, um, that investment in them while that technology is still kind of pre-full commercialization is we recognize our large emission source. We see carbon capture as an opportunity for that. And when you look at the type of, um, call it the CO2 emission characteristics that come out of our compressor units, there is no technology out there today at a commercial scale that's been demonstrated for that. And as a result, um, partnering with them, helping them understand our challenge, our problem in this space, um, as, as one of the many investors involved, will help um, 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 steer that to more meaningful application for us and potentially to a live pilot, which we're very much interested in doing to, to, to realize our longer term 2050 target. So this is one example of what we've done, and we're, we're actively looking for other areas where we see potentials to decarbonize our existing assets as a priority or leverage it because this is going to be a huge growth area in the future and we, we believe we are, we're one of the energy infrastructure companies that can support that. So those are kind of the two areas we're looking at for strategic investments a little earlier than we might have, um, I'd say, previously. So obviously you're comfortable or you've made, you sort of had a shift in mindset in terms of stepping into the space where you're going to de-risk, support the de-risking of some ideas. It, it, it's absolutely important and um, you know, I, was, I made a comment to a few people, this space, part of the challenge, and you know, everyone wants us to move very quickly here, but both parties are learning. Um, we're learning who's out there, what's out there. We get up, hit up every week, every day with lots of great ideas. Um, part of the challenge of those ideas really building traction is they're also learning our, about our operations. Um, you know, once, once they recognize kind of some of the challenges we have, it, it, it changes what they're willing to do. And so um, rather than taking um, technologies as they are, we, we need to work closely with those companies to better you know, pivot them to something that's more meaningful and that we see the ability to take to scale within our operations for decarbonization. So who's best to underwrite the risk from an innovation and commercialization perspective? Um, should it be government, should it be business, should it be both? Do we need a co-invest model? And why is it so hard for new ideas to get attention? I'm just curious too, how many deals do you look at before you actually make a decision to invest in something? We say that we probably see a 1,000 at least a year, um, and most of those funnel down to about a deal a quarter. So a 1,000 down to four a year, and our fund is a 12 to 14 year 
lifetime fund and we'll make probably 16 investments over that time horizon. So if you do the math, we will literally see thousands and thousands of deals that we only make a handful in. Um, and there's not a lot of venture capital institutions out there either. So like I said, not every company is well set up for venture um, and is is there there is... There is a healthy ecosystem and it is continuing to grow, but it, it is tough um, and the odds are somewhat stacked against you. So it is challenging, but it, in terms of your risk um, considerations, um, one thing I do keep in mind, I think at the very, very early beginnings, government does play that big role of providing grants, particularly out of academic institutions and the like. Um, we come in early to support and match and, and help, you know, add some some capital early on to help help teams, you know, build a team out, build a bigger executive team out that can sort of start to build uh, commercial traction and marketing traction, et cetera. Um, they're getting out of university labs and getting their own lab set up, they're sort of formalizing the IP. That's a pretty high level of risk for an institution like RBC to come in. Um, and so we take on that risk and we help these companies sort of get through. Um, as companies get bigger and as they scale and as success, you know, we get success, hopefully, the risk profile does come down with time, um, but also the capital needs grow substantially. So from an early stage, you're looking for a few hundred thousand dollars. And then your next stage, it's a couple million and then tens of millions. And then by the time you get to needing hundreds of millions of dollars, most companies are able to have a conversation with the likes of RBC and others. And, and the risk has been brought to a different level. That's not true in every case. Obviously, companies like Tesla and Rivian, some of these literally raised billions of dollars, you know, before they went public or whatever. And, and there's number of paths to doing that. But the idea is that you de-risk with time and the capital kind of matches that. And you have different investors across that threshold that are willing to take those different kinds of risks as the company grows bigger and bigger and bigger. Greg, your, your, your lens, your investment lens, tell us about that. You know, every investor class has a different risk appetite, as we mentioned before, and not just VC strategic and institutional capital, but also equity investors versus debt investors. You can, it, it's very unnatural to try to force risks onto an investor class that they're not willing to accept. And in fact, it doesn't really happen. And, and so the challenge you have is, is, you know, in sourcing capital is to look at an opportunity and say, what is the risk profile of that opportunity? Where does it best sit? And a lot of the failures on energy transition on capital raising that we see are because a company is trying to access the wrong source of, of capital. The biggest challenge right now in energy transition are there, there are actually risks in energy transition that nobody is willing to underwrite. You know, you have a carbon pricing risk where we don't have a mechanism in Canada for establishing a floor on that pricing. Who's going to underwrite that risk? And right now, all of the investor classes are looking at each other saying, are you, you know, who's carrying that, that, uh, that risk? You also have the pace of adoption risk, and, and Derek talked a little bit about this in the, the keynote address, where you know energy transition is by definition inflationary. And we're seeing a lot of consumer pushback on inflation. Who's going to carry the timing of adoption risk? So the government has a, a role to play here as well as the classes of capital that we've talked about, because there are risks in what we're all trying to do that the government is going to have to step up and accept. So from that, you, you touched briefly about that, uh, the, the carbon price floor. Um, talk a bit more about that in terms of what it means for, for being able to invest risk capital and actually move forward on a technology. You know, uh, most of the energy transition models that we see include in their revenue and, and ultimately in their profit forecasts some compensation for the carbon that they're not emitting, right? So if you think about a CCS model, um, some of the revenue is, generate, is, is based upon the credits that they're generating by putting the carbon in the ground. If you want to lend money against that business model, if you as an equity investor want to put money into that business, you need to understand what that revenue profile looks like because that's your return proposition. How do you do that if the price of carbon could be $40 a ton, it could be $200 a ton? I mean, most forecasts would suggest that over the course of the next 30 to 40 years, the price of carbon, the car price of the carbon credit should go up. 
But if you think about it intuitively, eventually it's going to go down because eventually enough businesses have decarbonized, buying those credits is no longer necessity for them. So if there is a theoretical peaking point for, for carbon credits. So imagine if you're trying to finance a CCS project with a 30 or 40 year amortization and part of the revenue forecast for that project is the price of carbon, where is that peaking point? How do you forecast it? If the government were to come in and say, legislation, never will the, f the price of carbon be less than X, now you have something to base that revenue forecast on. And that is effectively what the IRA has done in, in, in the US and one of the key mechanisms that Canada is lacking right now. So let's just t pick that up. So that's $85 a ton. That's getting paid. It's not a credit. Um, right now we have a emissions cap proposal that is basically only allowing for credits to be created and traded within a sector. So how is that going to sort of push the, the financing and commercialization curve in Canada versus companies saying, well, I guess I'm going down south because I can get access to capital. I can get the ability to test something and the economics are different. You have a, do you want to start, Aaron, do you want to go and, and rolling? I mean, you guys are in Houston, you see it? Yeah. Sure, I'll, uh, I'll jump in here. Um, I mean, for the record, the IRA is historical. It is unprecedented. It's huge. Um, it is getting the U.S. to reduce emissions by a billion tons a year by 2030. That is more than all of Canada's emissions. Just to put that in context, like that would get Canada to net zero and then some. Uh, so it's huge. And the incentives are all over the place. <laughs> There's a lot in that in that document, but it is a material boost to carbon capture, both for uh, direct uh, carbon capture from a from a combustion uh, captured source, but also for direct air capture. It, um, literally increases the the rate that you can get paid you know up to 180 something dollars per ton and it reduces the threshold of how big that facility has to be by two orders of magnitude so if you build a thousand ton per day facility you can generate at minimum a guaranteed you know direct payment of 180 plus dollars per per ton, um, which is huge. That That is game changing. Um, we haven't even seen DAC facilities that big um, at this point in time. So, so that's huge. Um, second is hydrogen. So for those of you that follow green hydrogen electrolysis, um, specifically, you know, it's, it's expensive, um, probably in the realm of six to $10 per kilogram of hydrogen and the going rate of hydrogen is somewhere between two and $3 per kilogram. Um, this gives you up to a $3 per kilogram incentive to produce hydrogen. So I'm not sure that it makes the economics work in every scenario and certainly electricity costs are the major driver of that, but it certainly puts a lot more projects in the green, so to speak. Um, and it often, and it opens the doors for a lot of other, other types of hydrogen production as well. So that's the second really big one. Um, electrification is huge in this. It's transmission, it's um, EV incentives. So you can get $7,500 um, to buy an electric vehicle and on and on and on. Like there's just so much money flooding the clean tech sector in this space to the extent that I think the day the IRA announced um, that this bill was passed, um, clean tech markets shot up like 20 to 30% day of. That's huge. So this is unprecedented. And if you're a Canadian clean tech company and you don't already have significant, say, grant funding or, or sort of government-backed funding or you're, you're really deep in a project, most of these companies are looking at the U.S. now and going, wow, I have a horizon to, to really monetize my technology, move quickly. There's a lot of momentum for deployment. So I think, unfortunately, in the short term, it's, it's a bit painful for Canada. Um, <laughs> we tend to be leaders, and then we sort of stagnate, and then others catch up and surpass us, and we go, oh, we got to catch up and <laughs> make the next tranche. So it's a little bit frustrating. Um, it's, it's, it's this complicated act of where all the tech is going and it seems to be that the U.S. is pulling a lot of that right now. Um, hopefully in the long run Canada does benefit from longer term reductions in costs and the like and the U.S. obviously drives a lot of our economy as well but uh, it's a little painful in the short term I think. So Roland, TC has obviously a presence in the states. Have you started to see a shift in terms of how you're assessing opportunities from an investment standpoint on the clean tech side? Yeah, so, I mean, TC has operations in, in Canada, the U.S., and Mexico. Um, when we look at our priorities, which I spoke to earlier around in investing in this space, um, they're strategic investments. They're aimed at 
decarbonizing our base assets primarily, and then secondarily looking at growth opportunities. Um, we're looking all across the board. In fact, we're not just looking in the, in the U.S. or Canada, we're looking globally as well. In fact, Carbon Clean, which I mentioned earlier, is a U.K.-based firm. Now, the, the trick comes in, and I'll put on kind of my, my uh, more operational and technical hat. Uh, Greg spoke to it a bit earlier. There, there's risk here, and part of that risk isn't just in the development cycle, it's also in the operational cycle. So um, folks are worried about, you know, if, if you look at CO2 pipelines bil being built in, in various jurisdictions, what happens with those CO2 pipelines if there's an incident? Can we really sequester that CO2 safely indefinitely, right? And so you, you actually need platforms where you can deploy these technologies, demonstrate them, iterate with the various agencies out there that provide the regulations that yes, this will work, or no, we need to do this to improve. What I see the RA doing globally for energy transition is providing that platform first, which is fantastic. Everybody will benefit. This is not just a benefit for companies based out of the U.S. This is a benefit for all of us because there is huge risk with everything being proposed out there. And I think to the extent we can leverage opportunities that allow you to um, leverage platforms in the United States that, you know, for example, our platform or other platforms, I'm excited. I think that's great because it allows us to de-risk it and really provide those proof points that this won't just be a, a development cycle. This will be a cycle to actually reducing emissions, which is our end goal here. So you could see potentially Canadian projects going south, de-risking what they're doing, and then coming back? Absolutely. I, I don't see why, why, they, why they wouldn't look to that. I, I, I get that it could be a bit complicated, but the thing is, um, if you're doing well as a Canadian company, you'll probably do well internationally, right? So you can start in the U.S., you can come back to Canada. Um, uh, you know, another example is when we've looked at how do we, um, you know, who's ahead in this space, how do we learn from them quickly, I'll pick hydrogen blending. We actually started that effort looking at companies in Europe because they're, they've been doing it before us. And so, you know, um, not only should the innovators be looking at um, other jurisdictions, we're looking at other jurisdictions because this is a global challenge. Um, we're looking at to, to, to benefit um, driving down our emissions, but then the next step is, is, is benefiting growth for everybody in this space where we see a large amount of opportunity. Greg. You know, the U.S. has a long, across many different policy avenues, not just energy, has a long history of applying overstimulus to catalyze movement, and then they repeal the stimulus on a selective basis once they dis understand what's working and what isn't. So if you thought about that model, you, you stimulate, you watch the commercial models that evolve, and then you pull back the stimulus where it's not working or once it's had its effect. Canada's policy approach across many different avenues, uh, decarbonization included, is designed to get the model exactly right. Right? It, it's, the carbon tax ratchets up. It's supposed to squeeze companies into adopting decarbonization. The challenge is if you're trying to affect rapid change, if, if you're trying to conserve capital, getting it precisely right is maybe the way you want to go. If you're trying to affect rapid change, you want to hyperstimulate. And, and this is the fundamental difference right now between Canada and the States, is the US is really stimulating that innovation. Canada is an innovative place, and we're seeing many different <laughs> companies that are highly innovative, many of whom are in this room. But they're all looking at the States, because you have in the States, you have a direct pay window where you can go deploy your capital, decarbonize, walk up to this government window and get paid back. That does not exist in Canada. The, the stimulus in Canada is negative. You're avoiding tax. And so there's a big difference if you're, if you're incurring some level of risk, and we all are in energy transition, there's a big difference between getting your money back versus doing it to try to avoid a future tax. Yeah, we look at sticks versus carrots, and that's that's generally the approach they've taken. But you talked about revolutionary change, and you know there's revolutionary change, there's incremental change, and um, I'm just curious from a funding standpoint, are the VCs and PE firms too focused on revolutionary change, and that hail mary pass, so to speak, rather than companies that can make a difference through incremental change? And what's the difference in terms of how you access funding? in those two different models. I mean, we often say perfection's the enemy of good. Um, just curious as to how that plays out and whether we need a bit of a reset in terms of timing, valuation, and uh, what we look at. You know, it, it's really the VC's job to embrace revolutionary change, right? Like if you thought about the whole spectrum of decarbonization, 
you know, let's talk about methane reduction. That's an incremental change that is really, really important for Canada, for the oil and gas industry, but that's actually an incremental change or a business model that most investors, including institutional capital, can wrap their mind around. You're not emitting methane into the atmosphere, you're selling the molecules instead, there's a capital component to that, there's a return, and then there's a social impact. That's kind of quantifiable, so th that incremental change is relatively easy to find funding for because it has less risk and it's easier to quantify. The revolutionary change, that's Aaron's department because they are swinging for the fences and as she said, a thousand opportunities and you're picking 16, you're really looking, I think, for the uh, opportunities that have a truly monumental what we call a TAM or a total addressable market. I'll echo that. So what I will say is a lot of venture-backed companies are revolutionary for sure, and they're taking on market risk, they're taking on technology risk, um, and a whole bunch of other things that um, there's a lot of uncertainty, and they are rewarded for taking that risk and being bold and going out there um, and creating these opportunities. Um, there are only a few, and they're market makers and they're trailblazers. And what I like to think is that they launch forward and show that there's a possible path forward, and it, it creates the opportunity for other companies to come in later on come in behind once some of that risk has been taken off the table. Like you think about electric vehicles, the early funders of Tesla, for example, those are those are venture backed company. It's a venture backed company and it the risk profile mirrored that and look at today how many electric vehicles there are today. Now that others have seen that, hey, there is a market opportunity here. It has been de-risked to a degree because people are adopting them. There is customer risk that's now been managed, market risk that's been managed and creating creating opportunities for others to come in and see a monetization path. There isn't always a clear monetization path up front for a VC um, backed company for an early stage company that's looking to revolutionize the world. And I think just to speak of the times we're in this period where it feels like we need a lot of revolutionary solutions. We're trying to break through energy paradigms. We're trying to break through things that are unprecedented. And the market conditions are unclear. There's uncertainties. And I think as you start to see these early companies break through and, and demonstrate that a monetization path is possible. How do you do that and how do you follow? You are seeing a lot of others and I'll give Direct Air Capture as an example. Three years ago even, most of us probably could have only named three. Uh, if you were knowledgeable of the space, it would have been Global Thermostat, Carbon Engineering and Climeworks. These companies were trailblazers, they paved the way, but they'd been around for 10 years um, and there wasn't a lot of movement around that. Now, there are incentives for DAC. There is also a voluntary carbon market that shows that there's a possible monetization path that wouldn't have maybe existed had some of those companies not come in early. And in the last year, actually the last couple months, I can count probably 20 to 30 DAC companies specifically um, that have emerged in the last year or two and, and are finding their way forward. They're finding a monetization path. They're still venture backed. They're still early, but, but it is paving the way for more and more of these companies to see a path forward and to see a path to success and more and more institutional larger corporations signing up for, you know, early offtake agreements and things like that. And, and it is slowly coming, but that return in risk profile is there for a reason, uh, and it hopefully paves the way for, for lower risk and more, more companies to come through later on um, in the past. You said your fund's a 12 to 14 year horizon. Is that too long? Not long enough? I'm curious because that's, that's a long time horizon. It is a long term horizon, and I think for us, we invest in hard tech um, in the stuff that's really difficult. Like we're investing in first of a kind hydrogen generation, carbon capture, um, energy storage, and you name it takes a long time to go from you know, ideation and conception all the way through prototyping to a commercial scale. It could be 10 plus years. So it doesn't necessarily take that long for us to monetize that um, and, and have an exit that comes sooner than that. But, but we're patient in the sense that we recognize it does take time. And historically, a lot of VCs were set up for, you know, a five to six year horizon. And I think we recognize that's just simply not long enough for some of these really hard, you know, deep decarbonization type technologies to really get legs under them and, and show that they can be materially meaningful and, and carbon. We often talk about a disconnect in markets in terms of the finance community wants to see a result sooner and the innovators don't seem to, there's a, 
they say, well, it's going to take me longer to figure things out. So how do we sort of find a happy medium in terms of the time to scale risk, the time to pay out, and sort of recalibrate that investment cycle with the innovation cycle? Greg? You know, the, the, there's really two components that make a, a business work, and, and they're probably equally important. One is the tech or the vision or the problem that a company is trying to solve. The other is capital structure. There are a lot of great companies that had great ideas that have failed because the capital structure got messed up early and it became uninvestable. What There's do you mean a, by that? What do you mean by messed up early? You know, if, if a company chooses the wrong investors, wrong investors that put timelines on monetization, if it introduces debt into a capital structure that really isn't designed for debt and it's you know, the, the type of predatory debt where the debt investor plans on owning the company if the company can't meet, meet its timelines. Like, different types of capital come into a, a capital structure and may not be uh, best suited for the risk or, or for the timeline that a company is going to take. That's, the, the timeline is one of the challenges because you may look and think it's a five-year timeline to EBITDA positive EBITDA, it may weren't, turn out to be eight or 10. Most companies do not estimate on the conservative side on their timeline to EBITDA, I would say. There's nothing wrong with the rational, exuber rational exuberance. Roland, you, had, you wanted to weigh in on that as well. Yeah, no, uh, sorry. W one thing I'd build off of both these comments is uh, when we look at the targets we set out till 2050, that is a long time horizon. And so when you say, um, you know, your time to return, what, what I'm looking for, what I think we're looking for is, as, as a large emitter is I want certainty on that technology that will truly uh, put me in path to, to uh, net zero. We've made that commitment that we're going to be positioned for that. But what is the technology that's going to get me there? It's probably not here today or it's probably at the lab today. And so um, we are interested in um, um, those very, very early technologies. We may not upfront uh, put capital into them. Um, what we'll offer is expertise, um, 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 knowledge and the challenge, and then iteration on finding a, a viable solution. And, and we're doing that today. We're actively involved with various universities or um, you know, the, the, the tech accelerators. That's, that's our primary avenue for that. And ideally, at the right stage, it becomes something we can make a direct investment in and pilot. So, you know, I think it's um, what energy transition, at least from our perspective, is forced upon us is we do need to look further upstream. What we're learning is how far upstream to look and how best to engage upstream because there's different needs and different challenges. So I've, I've had the opportunity to sit through a bunch of CDL Rocky sessions and listen to a lot of people come up with some very good ideas. And then at the end of their pitch and their presentation, they say, well, what do you need help with is the question. And the question, the answer is usually, I need someone to help me get in the door. TransCanada, Enbridge, Synovus, whoever it is. So are you seeing a mindset where companies now are saying, okay, we have a portal. We're willing to look at things, help you de-risk and, and look at it. Because the innovators have always had a trouble getting in the door. So are we seeing a shift in the mindset, broadly speaking, from that perspective, or is it just a one? It's on a case by case basis. Yeah, I think we are seeing a shift. You know, um, to give example for TC Energy, we we participate in the Avatar program based out of Calgary. It's a it's a tech accelerator program, and and we saw great um, uh, opportunity and value out of that. We've been in I think the last two three years. Probably somebody here knows better than me. Um, then just this year, we've been participating in the Rice Alliance, and it's a very similar uh, tech accelerator. So, you know, we've gone from just participating one to saying, okay, well, we need a U.S.-based one as well to get those ideas out there. So we're very open to that. Um, we see that as a very viable avenue. And, you know, the, the Rice one is very interesting because... That's in Texas. Rice is in, in Houston, yeah, in Houston, yeah. Texas. Yeah, part of, part of that one is, is there is an expectation that uh, you'll, you'll commit resources to, to working with these um, innovators to help them um, fine tune their solutions for a 12 week period. So, you know, I think um, this is one of the great avenues to, to bridging that gap that you're, that you're highlighting. Yeah. It's, it's often something that people, um, what about talent? How are we doing on the talent front? Anybody want to take that? Sure, I, I, I could maybe uh, kick, kick off the conversation here. And, you know, uh, one thing TC Energy has done is, historically people might have said, we're the company that delivers energy safely um, every day, 24-7, for, for the folks who need it. Um, what we've said going forward as we've looked at the needs of the energy transition is we actually need energy problem solvers. We're actually approaching the challenge um, 
with the customer mindset first. We're saying, what, what do our customers need? And as a result of what they need, what solutions can we bring to the table? We have a platform that can offer this. We have the technolo technology um, background um, with engineers and, and folks in that space. But Energy Problem Solver isn't just for the folks who have a tech mindset like me or other folks in the company. Um, there's, there's, you know, two folks sitting here in a financial background or the legal background. So I think if, um, if, if folks have the right mindset, because some of the questions I've gotten in this space is, Roland, I see that um, oil and gas is maybe going away. What, what do I do with my career? And you know, m my, my advice to them is you need to be mentally agile and flexible. And part of that for our organization is, is, is pivoting your mindset to just delivering the energy to solving um, energy problems, not just for TC energy, but for the broad um, uh, consumer base out there that's, that needs it. For us, uh, you know, I know Roland is looking at the technical specs of these technology companies and going, okay, this is the rank of who's the best in this space. And uh, the institutional investors also are wanting to see that the tech risk has been, you know, reduced to a minimum and the technology works. That's not even a question for us because we're taking on that tech risk and there's a lot of variables on the table that we're working with. I would say almost all of them boil down to one thing. And one thing is, is the team and the leadership behind it. Um, and a good leader of a company, a good CEO, will, will bust through walls. They will figure out the financial challenges. They will figure out the technical problems. They will execute. And they will be able to raise capital. And they will execute. And so time and time and time again, it, it all boils down to that that individual and that team's leadership propensity and, and their ability to ultimately execute. So that's what we're actually investing in at the end of the day. And it's something that a lot of other uh, investors and, and technology partners don't necessarily consider um, because they're very focused on the technology side of it. Um, for us, it's really about that core execution and, and time and time again, we'll do that. Is that talent available here in Canada and does it exist here? Uh, we've seen a lot of great examples of it, both first time CEOs who are out there absolutely killing it and doing incredible things and surprise us every day, every month, um, you know, the kinds of deals that they're able to garner, it's, it's incredible. Um, there is, there is, that's not the case everywhere and it's really hard to put your finger on what makes a good CEO, what makes a good leader. Um, we all have attributes that we like and that we sort of value in different, uh, different you know, contestants, but ultimately it boils down to that and those that have that quality seem to be very, very successful at the end of the day and they figure a way through. Um, so that's ultimately what it boils down to and, and part of it is training and programs and things like that, but but that is, I think, fundamentally the hardest thing <laughs> in all of this is that uh, is that leadership quality. Got seven and a half minutes. Does anybody have any questions? No pitches though. <laughs> you can talk to me later. It's not Dragon's Den. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, I've, I've noticed a little bit of a trend of more innovation, energy transition teams, and with that comes different types of internal funding mechanisms. Uh, maybe question for Aaron. Have you noticed a little bit of a trend where corporations are starting to maybe enter that VC space a little bit? And are there any existing collaboration models for them to learn from successful VCs? Absolutely. So Evoke, for those of you who know about Evoke Innovations, was actually founded by Suncor and Synovus, um, who recognized the need for funding early stage companies, uh, particularly in ESG focused technologies, um, that there needed to be a way to pave them through, get them through the proverbial valley of death and get them to the other side so that they could use them. Uh, so we had a really close, or we have a very close partnership with Suncor and Synovus, whereby a lot of the technologies that we evaluated, uh, we would chat with the technical folks and the business development units and say, hey, if this is successful, what does that mean to you as a company? And what would that commercialization path look like? TC is obviously doing similar things. The Avatar program here in, in Calgary is, is embodying that type of corporate engagement at an earlier stage. Um, I'd say holistically, and if you look around the world, there are a lot of large corporations that have what are called CVCs. They're corporate venture capital um, entities and they're sort of subgroups within the companies that are targeting venture capital and they are that lens into the company for longer term commercializations. They're a bit selfishly motivated, I guess I'll say, um, because they're looking for technologies that exclusively serve their own needs. But there certainly is a space for that and, and there are a lot of very active corporate VCs, VP, Shell, um, most large uh, institutions uh, from a technical perspective do have some kind of corporate venture capital arm, but there are um, evolving models and different types of approaches that different companies are taking and, uh, and we're seeing more and more of that. Maybe Roland, do you want to speak a little bit to the Avatar program and, and your involvement in that? 
Yeah, I mean, I think, um, funnily enough, I, I know part of the, your line of question. I mean, we, we, we've participated in the Avatar program, which, which allows um, folks to bring in um, various tech companies in and, and get evaluated and brings in a number of uh, corporate partners to, to participate in that evaluation. And then, and then, you know, if that goes forward, there's capital funding available. But probably the example I, I might give, give for your question is, is on the VC side, is there are venture capital funds, which TC Energy as an example is a part of, Energy Impact Partners allows, gives us a broad look at the landscape, gives us an opportunity to look a lot further upstream, and doesn't encumber us to um, be as actively involved at a stage we might not be. And so I think, you know, the, the venture capital space, which is, is primarily your area, you know, there's companies like yours we can engage with, but where TC has made its first kind of engagement in that space is with the Energy Impact Partners, which really allows us to participate as a kind of a um, observer of that space. We get voting rights there on various companies, but it's across a number of other companies how we get those voting rights and what technologies move forward. Greg, do you have anything to add? You know, I, I, I think this uh, action by companies on early stage investment is, is everywhere. RBC, again, is, is deploying capital into early stage VC funds for a different purpose. Through what mechanism? Like, I'm curious, because everything, but everybody uh, thinks of a big bank in, and they direct go... Direct investment yeah. into funds. I mean, we are an investor in Evoke. And um, we also have a program called RBCX, which is an early stage, you know, it, it, accelerator program of a different sort, which is venture debt. So when we have a VC partner that's invested equity into an organization, and if that organization meets certain criteria, we can provide a, a very gentle form of what we call venture debt to help boost that company in terms of the capital that they have available to us. So I think you're seeing innovation across all sorts of different corporate models from Canada's largest company, largest energy transporter, right down to small companies. Everyone's trying to do their bit. As Derek said on the stage earlier, you know, energy transition is generally a top three topic for every management team, certainly across Canada. Question at the back. Yeah, just the focus on, from the venture capital on sort of the widget or the technology and the innovation going into some of these renewable applications. What about just the project funding itself? So we need X number of new projects to go online for this energy transition. How are they uh, starting to move towards funding teams that are, you know, crushing it at the project development stage in both renewables and critical metals and things along those lines? I can definitely speak to that. Um, I would say VCs are almost allergic to project investments. <laughs> um, no, but truthfully, like where we invest is that early phase where it's like the tech isn't there, the, the, you know, the development is still very ripe for disruption and, and there's a lot of variables to work through. Once that's been, once the first of a kind plant has been built and some of that technology has come off, the, the technology risk has come off the table, a lot of things have been established in this company. Most of these companies will then be poised for project companies and that's where I think the mechanism and the vehicle for funding transitions. And I say that because for one, venture capital is quite expensive um, and the risk appetite reflects that. By the time you've created a successful first of a kind or even maybe a second of a kind plant and you're ready to scale that and rubber stamp that on the map in a bunch of different ways, you're, you're ready for a different kind of capital. And that's where the likes of Greg are like, oh, we have a first of a kind that now can be a hundredth of a kind, and we can scale this and put hundreds of millions, if not billions, behind this. And that's what institutions like, say, CPPIB and others are really well positioned to, to finance. So um, if you're at that tipping point where you've sort of scaled into that phase and you're ready to deploy projects all over the place, you're in a whole other class and, and you've de-risked the project sufficiently that I think you can invite a lot of um, different forms of capital that you don't need venture. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, if you're at a place where you have a predictable pipeline of projects and you have either line of sight to positive EBITDA or achieving positive EBITDA, that's really now the territory where you see institutional capital. If, you know, pre-IPO capital step in and, and provide equity into the business to grow. Because for, for institutional capital, the IRR is now predictable. The market is understood. The margins are understood. So that's really where you're transitioning away from VC or strategic capital and, and towards uh, sort of the world of institutional capital. We've got 30 seconds. One last quick question at the back, in the middle there. 
Hi, thanks. Um, we've been talking a lot about the capitalization of the development cycle for you know venture strategic um, and institutional. We also have on the other side of the wall 2030 and, and 2050 targets. And I wanted to just get your sense about how we should be thinking about our speed to deployment and speed to scale. If it takes Aaron 10, 15 years to get an idea, then roll for Roland to look at five, 10 years for him, five, 10, 15 years for Greg at the end. Should we be, how should we be thinking about that development cycle differently? There's a lot to unpack in that question. Uh, you know, 28 years ago, uh, SAG D, for those of you that understand oil sands, was an experiment. There was no horizontal drilling. 28 years ago, Shell was thinking about the first directional well to be drilled in, in North America. The first multi-stage frack well had three fracks in it. So that was 28 years ago in, in conventional oil and gas. And look at what we have achieved today. 28 years is a long time. And, and it's the, the growth rate when the capital engine fires up, when technology advancement fires up, when you have hyperstimulus like the IRA, it's an exponential change curve. So measure progress from today to a year ago, it doesn't feel that impressive. Let's talk in three or four years and, and see what the rate of change is. I, I think, you know, we, we all, everyone in this room has hope. I, I don't think otherwise we wouldn't have chosen this as a, as a business path. I could add one comment to, to that question. It, it is the challenge. Um, you know, when we look at um, what's really going to drive this space, there's a number of factors, but one of the biggest ones is the partnerships that are getting formed. And you know, we've, we've, we've built out certain partnerships and they're continuing to look for more. And partnerships I'm talking about, whether it's vendors, um, customers, in the case I'm specifically thinking of, um, they, they have certain needs. Um, you know, the, 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 the two partnerships we've signed are with Heisen Motors and Nikola. Those folks are looking to both disrupt the, 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 the you know, class eight fuel uh, trucking market and, and deploy these trucks very soon. I think through effective partnerships that kind of put that tension on companies to say, hey, there's a need today. It's not just a far out need for your decarbonization targets. That, that starts to create a bit of that accelerant and, and companies find a way to do that. So I'm, I'm optimistic, I'm excited actually. Um, there's more companies out there like that who have technologies they're looking to deploy, they're looking perhaps to scale them and it's the partnerships that will they'll perhaps drive that accelerant. Last word to you and then we'll wrap up. I'll just add one thing. Um, for those of you who read Canada's you know, very ambitious emissions reduction plan, probably not in full detail, but it was very ambitious. It covered a lot of ground. And then the budget provided, I think, $9 billion for that this year. And I went, oh, that's, that's nice. That would maybe build one hydro dam, maybe. <laughs> Money is a big part of this, obviously. This is a capitally intensive process to get to transition, and I think it's really encouraging to see what the U.S. is doing. That's certainly going to accelerate a lot, and I'd love to see Canada step up as well. If you look at China, China is fascinating. Um, the way that they developed a strategic plan 10 years ago and decided that they were going to be the battery manufacturer and they were going to be the, the, the go-to for building the EV economy, it's incredible what they've achieved in 10 years, and a lot of money has gone into that and a lot of focus, um, but it really needs that momentum of financing and, and capital to really push some of this forward faster. And I think we're seeing more of it, but we need we need more and more of it, and we need more people coming to the table, more partnerships, um, more more partnerships to to enable this to happen that much faster. So I think we can do it, uh, but it is going to take a lot, and we all have to roll up our sleeves and, and get in it. Whether you're finance or uh, government uh, investors and um, and innovators alike. Financial capital and political capital both have to be spent. Uh, please join me in, in thanking our panelists this morning. Thank you.